<laughs> What's well, a beautiful day in the town of Pocahontas today. It's the long-awaited reopening of the historic Pocahontas Exhibition Mines. We've waited two years for renovations and uh, safety things that we've been able to do through the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy. Thanks to a grant from the abandoned mine uh, funds, we were able to do a lot of improvements inside the mines and we're looking forward to people to come and visit the mines. Uh, my name is Benjamin Gibson, I'm Mayor of Pocahontas, most of you know me. Uh, today we're celebrating a soft opening of the exhibition mines. Um, the mines have been closed for two years to, uh, due to some renovations that was provided by the uh, pilot project of the Park of Mines and Minerals and Energy. Uh, the town of Pocahontas received $1.5 million um, around two years ago and last year we uh, received an additional $300-some thousand dollars. It was broken down into two, two phases. The first phase was to stabilize this mine, asphalt the parking lot, uh, rewire the uh, exhibition museum mines, um, and build a 2,200 square foot restaurant. Now, when you walk into the mines today, um, we, we wanted to keep it as natural as it was. We did not want huge changes in here because that's what's special about this mine. So there was a lot of roof bolting done, new electrical. Uh, there's kiosks, um, there's six of them throughout the mines that in the months to come, they will tell individual stories of the section that you're in. Any coal miners here, I don't know, you're coal miners. So y'all will see there'll be a kiosk at the dinner hole and later on it will tell what the dinner hole was or what a break was or what type of piece of machinery it was. Um, they are uh, wireless, they're waterproof, you'll be amazed what they are. Uh, you know, we appreciate everyone coming out. We hope to have a bigger grand opening in a few months. Um, y'all are the first tour, so y'all get an extra surprise today that most people will not see for months. Y'all will be able to go in the restaurant part. I'm going to get the keys and we're going to go inside after you tour the mines and then for a few more months it'll be closed down. But um, we appreciate everyone coming out. And this is Michelle and this is Brandon. Um, you know, they're a little nervous today. This is the first tour. Uh, getting open back up but uh we appreciate everyone coming out thank y'all all right guys like ben said i'm michelle this is brandon if y'all want to just start following me we'll make our way up like this is the whole reason that this mine even started a blacksmith that lived about a mile and a half from here named jordan nelson found an outcrop like this and used it for his blacksmithing shop um wasn't too long later that Jed Hotchkiss came along and started making notes about this outcrop. That's how it just pushed on through and started being shipped all over America. Y'all just want to keep on coming with me. And like Ben said, I am nervous. This is my first tour. The doorway that we just walked into. This was originally the exit of the mines. This is where the, the fan was. And we'll be going out through the entrance once we make our way around. Right here is where a radish cloth hung. I'm not exactly sure of the term that was used back then when this mine was open, um, but they would normally have young boys pull that to keep the oxygen out of the mines if they needed to, you know, keep it down if there were gases and things like that. So if you'll just keep walking with me. <laughs> I'll just keep talking just a little bit until we get to our first stop again. Um, of course, this mine was opened in 1882. Within a year, they had sh shipped out their first coal car of coal, and it went to the Norfolk, Virginia mayor as a gift. Now, who actually owned this mine? Um, it was started by Southwest Virginia Improvement Company back then, but of course, it changed several times and ended up being Pocahontas Fuel Company. Um, over here to the left you'll see an example of the, the coal seam. Um, this one says 10 foot but it has been noted that it went all the way up to 15 foot in different areas. Y'all can just keep walking. <laughs> uh, how old is this coal? 
How old is this gold? Yeah. Oh, millions and millions of years. <laughs> um, that is something, not the date exactly, but I will talk just a little bit about that here in just a second. Now over here to my left, you'll see what Ben was talking about outside. This is one of the kiosks that were placed in the mines. Um, this is phase two of the grant. Um, BMME is still working on the programming. Later on, this will be drove through again, um, only it'll be a, a golf cart trolley style system. Um, you know, back in the day, they was allowed to drive their cars through the mine. However, that got stopped because the exhaust from the cars started to do damage to the walls and the ceilings in the mines. Over here on my right, I'll let y'all walk it just a little bit closer, and I'll shine my light so that you can see. This is a good example of what they did once the coal was mined. They would knock out the timbers that were cut locally and let it fall in so they knew that it had been completely mined. Can everybody see? Did everybody see it back there? Yeah. <laughs> now if you'll notice over on your right, my left, um, this is a Morgan cutter. Um, unfortunately, some of the timbers have fell on top of that. Um, the mine is safe. Let me assure you that the mine is safe. Um, one of the first phases of the grant that BMME did was to come in and put many more roof bolts, um, Heisman jacks, and they did the electrical too. So you are safe walking through here with us. And keep in mind, none of these cutting machines were actually used in this mine. Here you have an example of a mine jeep. Um, and above it, you'll see one of the tools that was used in here, which is a breast auger. Uh, they would put it up against their breast and drill the holes for the dynamite and before they would blast they would always yell fire in the hole three times to let everybody know that they was getting ready to blast. And then right here you have an example of a crowler loader. Uh, this was actually what took the place of the miner. And right above me here, you'll see one of the very first fossils, which is in the shape of a fish. Can everybody see it? Okay, what kind of fish is that? I could not tell you that. <laughs> it's in the shape of a fish. <laughs> Crap. Um, okay, let's keep walking just a little bit further. Now, something, something that um, I wanted to share with y'all, and I'm sure most of you may know, but the Smithsonian actually came here in 2017 and did some video footage and took some silicone casts of the mine walls, some of the different fossils, and it is actually on display in the Deep Time Hall exhibit, which opened in 2019, and it is about the Carboniferous era, <laughs> which explains coal and how it was formed and those different types of things. Over here you have an eight-ton coal car, and 
actually the men were paid 30 cents a ton when this mine was opened. So you can imagine a, a coal car like this only brought in just a couple of dollars at the end of the day and it was all hand loaded in this mine. Over here to your right is the dinner hall. Okay. What do y'all see beside that mire? Rats. Rats. Uh, they must be a mire talking. Uh huh. Uh huh. And what did y'all do in the mines with those rats? Well, at last we started hanging our, our, our dinners from the wheel. But anyway, you know, the rats, we would. Uh, <laughs> well, back when this mine was open, not only were rats used, uh, but canaries as well. There's actually a canary farm just located right past the cemetery in that area um, when this mine was open. But the reason they like to feed the rats and things like that and kept the canaries in here, it would alert them to any gases or danger. If a miner seen the rats running for the door, they were right behind them. <laughs> and then right over here, behind here, there's another example on down. You'll see that basket. That was a rescue basket. They would carry the miners out in that if they were hurt. Now, here's a really good fossil as well. This is a tree, a poplar tree to be exact. Okay, do we know what kind of tree that is? That's a poplar tree. <laughs> I do know that one. <laughs> and then right over here on my right, your left, you'll see a hand dug undercut, which was done in the 1800s. Uh, this was not a paid job for the miners, so they would normally bring the young children in here to do that job for them. And then right on up here, you have a two-man saw. Some of these hand tools were used here in this mine. You have a two-man saw that was used to cut the timbers, which was the very first thing that held the roofs up for these miners. Long before roof bolts and, and things like that. Okay. Now, since I don't have any kids with me today, because I try not to talk too much about it, but um, as you know, March 13th, 1884, if you don't, 114 plus miners, children as well, were killed in this mine due to an explosion. It was exactly two years from the time that they had opened this mine. Um, that part of the mine was sealed off for 31 days. It was flooded, and then when they opened it, it was all drained into the to the creek here with a lot of disinfectant as well, but that's why the Pocahontas Cemetery was created for the, for the mine disaster that happened here in 1884. Anybody have any questions so far? Can everybody still hear me? Yeah. How many people worked at this mine at its maximum? That I can't answer, but it's a good question for me to write down to be able to answer later. I'm going to stop right here and wait for everybody in the back to catch up with us so I can show you all the next really cool fossil. Miners didn't think they were cool, but... <laughs> Okay, up here to my right, this is the best example of a kettle bottom or a widowmaker as the miners like to call it. Uh, this made a, a lot of wives with us. And this one is an oak tree. <laughs> Now 
Now here's an example of some of the other first parts of the grant. Uh, some of these jacks, well there were more jacks put in place here and there were also some moved in order to make room for the second part of the grant for the golf carts to be able to, to drive through here easily. And on your right, you'll notice the water. This is actually part of a 28 mile gravity drainage tunnel that was built by W.A. Bishop and it runs through five large, at that time it ran through five large mines. You'll see the beginning of it up here. There's a sump pump in place in this mine to keep the water out and to allow us to walk through. Over here on my right, you have a continuous miner. This helped take the place of a, a lot of miners as well. Put a lot of, a lot of guys out of work back then. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, once everyone gets up here, in the early 2000s, one two thousand two time frame. This area right here, they had a huge fall, and that kind of closed the mines for a while. And that time, Pat Herman was mayor, and uh, that's when the Port Mines and Minerals really got started here. They came in and removed the debris, and at the time, there was, they had some jacks here. And if you see, they just uh, you know roof bolted the brows here. You know, this was a lot of the work. This this section right here was really bad. Uh, your ribs, you see all the roof, they're bolting in the ribs, but this section was the worst in the early 2000s, and that's how it started with the relationship with Park Mountain Mills. But as time went on, uh, they came back, and this was some of the work they just recently did. Uh, this section right here, and Michelle, I don't know the height, you this is the high section right here in the mines. Uh, the height of this section, I think it's 28 feet. Uh, it's probably 20 something. This right here, we constantly, we have to come through, you know, you check your jacks if there's any looseness to them. Um, you know, you coal miners, y'all know the grid blocks and things, we got to check it. This is the section that we wash the most in here. It's just called the sheer sure, sure, sure height of it. And, um, but like Michelle said, this, this is the continuous miner, and uh, go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, I just want to add that part. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Um, right over here to my left is actually part of the drainage tunnel that was built by W.A. Bishop and it actually is 28 miles long and runs through um, all the way up to Anawal. And the coal seam that is here goes through seven states and ends in Alabama. Yeah, what's the name of this coal seam? What? What's the name of the coal scene? That's the number one coal scene. <laughs> and it's by two minutes, sub by two minutes coal. <laughs> it was the cleanest burning smokeless coal. Here's some of the, some of the original locust posts. They've been changed over the years. Uh, over the years we've moved some of these out and you know went back with the newer type of jack. Some are water jacks or screw jacks. But Used, used to be they used locust posts. When we first came in here 10 years ago, it was there was locust posts all the way down through here as time went on. Now, some of this looks like just a standard telephone pole, but on up the other side, there's some posts that, um, they're a treated type of timber from Australia, and those, those were experimental products that they tried in this mines in the early 2000s when they was rehabbing it. So a lot of stuff was donated to save this mine. So you'll see as you go through here, different products that was donated to the, to the town to help save this project. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. Um, over to your right, you'll see an example of a roof bolter. Um, I'm not good with years. I can't remember the exact year of this, but of course now there are much newer updated versions of the roof bolters. Um, you can see some different examples along the side there of roof bolts and on the 
the Rube Bolton machine itself. And I think there's even some adhesive over there. This here is a minor bus. And you would have six, eight men climb up on each side of this to take them into the mines. Again, not this mines, of course, but they would just crawl right on up in here. People normally in this area, I can't tell you how many people have crawled in this thing to take pictures <laughs> over the years. <laughs> and then on my right and left, there's a perfect example of rock dust. And I think this rock dust was done by the limestone quarry. And uh, the reason for that was to keep the coal dust down, to keep explosions from happening. Yeah, a lot of times people ask, you know, what this coal pile. What this is, you know, once or twice a year we have to come to the mines. This is coal that comes off the ridge. It's just stuff that barely starts falling and we have to do a routine cleaning and this is probably right here about a year's worth of just stuff that falls off your ribs and uh, it's just a natural process um, you know the town they'll, they'll bag that if you want to buy it <laughs> it's just useless a lot of people ask what we do with it but uh, that has fell off the ribs and then we slowly got up here and pile it up here that's what that is Now, of course, I'm sure most of you read the sign out front talking about the mine being established in 1882, how it was, uh, you know, called out um, within the first year. But if you look up here, that sign also mentions the different immigrants that were in this area, what made it so diverse. There were Italian stonemasons and these were done by the Italians. When you leave here, if you look at the different, at the bridge wall, when you exit out here in Paradise, if you look at those, those were also done by the stonemasons, the rock church that's in town, different things like that. So if you really look around here, you can see how much diversity was in this town at the time. Now we just exited out the original entrance of this mine. And a story that I've been told over the years as you walked out of that cold, cold mine, when the miners would come out, they said it felt like paradise. And that's how paradise got its name. Now that's just a story. I've not read it in a book. So <laughs> take it, take it with a grain of salt. It's just a really neat story to talk about. Guys, we're gonna go down this walkway. This is still under work, so kind of watch your steps. We're going to stop right here and talk a little bit what went on with the outside work of this building. All this rock was rescored, all new windows. The windows were took out, any panes that need to be replaced. And what was unusual about these windows, they had all the bars on the inside. They had to remove the bars, replace the bars, put them back. Uh, all of its original, other than this couple glass planes up on top, some of the windows were replaced, but most of those are original. Uh, when we first started this project, we wanted to, how could we protect those windows on top of the museum? We wanted to put plexiglass. We wasn't able to do that because Department of Historical Resources mm. said, please do not put plexiglass over it. So they were all replaced, um, new guttering, all new drainage around the outside water drainage. This building, uh, come to find out when it was, when they started working on it, it was still hooked to an original type sewer system. It was, hooked, was never hooked to the newer sewer system. So it was all had to be done. I mean, they went through here with new sewer lines, uh, new water lines, but this ramp through here on this right hand side, which you'll see more when we get inside the restaurant. In the future, this is where the food will be delivered through, through the trash we took out. Um, the least see on the restaurant, hold, uh, the, the restaurant is eventually going to stand outside dining through this door here. Um, Back here, we still got to do some sidewalk work. That's more phase two. But as you go down through here, kind of watch your step and we'll, we'll go inside the restaurant. That circular area where um, some of the roof bolt plates and the glue adhesive and all that is, that's actually where one of the main water tanks sat for the bathhouse. Just something interesting to, to note. Like you said, watch your step back here. Um, another, 
I think is a neat thing to uh, talk about was the electricity since the mines and the museum just got revamped, had pretty much an overhaul of all the electric. You might want to watch. Um, you yeah. got good boots on too, don't you? Y'all be really careful if you're not walking on the sidewalk up here. It gets quite muddy. Uh, but anyhow, one of the things that I was going to say, the mi this mine's actually received power for the very first time in 1903. Before that, of course, and you'll see some different examples of their different lights and things inside of the museum. Um, but in 1913, the town received power from the mines. And of course, all of the supervisors, superintendents, big bosses, things like that, were given free power. So y'all just keep on coming and, and uh, Ben's gonna show you all the start of the new restaurant yeah so where we're staying right now is the lobby entrance to the restaurant uh future restaurant uh what this right here i don't know how many's been here before so you remember what this was kind of mm -hmm. and i don't know michelle did you show them the original bathhouse there no okay no. let's walk down here first we'll take a left here i didn't know if we was yeah, able good. to do that on this tour we're going to today okay <laughs> just today there yes they're getting just a today. special tour <laughs> <laughs> take notes <laughs> right. yeah that's why the first tour was the best you got to see it all uh, so uh pull that right here this is where they wash the mules yes where's they wash the mules yeah <laughs> What you're standing in is part of the original bathhouse. Uh, when we applied for the grant, this was originally not post village. We just thank the more square footage. And after consideration and good points brought by other individuals, uh, we decided to leave this section for the historical purposes of it. Uh, it is also a list of restaurant. Uh, future, they can use it for whatever they need to. Uh, but it was just an option to leave it. Um, ten years ago, or even a year or two ago, you would come through here, this is really, and all the way through here, there was basket painted, and this bathhouse wall extended all the way down to the other end. Um, I don't know how many miners come through, but there was probably quite a few at one time. And uh, This is some of the original concrete that was left. Uh, this is a new section for water sewer that was put in, but um, all new heating and air conditioning put in. Those windows were covered. Uh, I don't know how many remember that the windows were covered, but those windows were actually redone. Uh, those actually the wood covers that went over the windows, but those windows were redone because it was just small, small things like that made a lot of difference in here, especially for the car. Before they had paneling boards all over the windows were knocked out, stuff, so all that was redone. Uh, but we'll make our way to the restaurant here and make our way. Something we have to know about the bathhouse here, and uh, of course the miners could use it daily, but on Sundays, the Oklahoma School Company allowed the miners' families to come on Sundays to the bath. Just a neat little bit of history there. <laughs> so these paintings were done in 1997 by a call of miles. And you know, that we wanted to preserve it. So the current construction this was all open. And this building had drop seal in it. All this wall was here covered. I mean, we, we chose an open theme roof in here. And we painted the black because we wanted to resemble, resemble coal. And the metal was to resemble more of an industrial look. Um, and that's the paint suit for themselves. Um, same type of lights here inside the mine. It's more LED type light in the roof. Uh, extra doors that we had to cover the windows that were stuck here, we put, put them on the wall for um, just cosmetic looks. Uh, this, this is actually, we're we'll holding 100 and some people in this room spread out. That uh, does have to have the above face here. Um, naturally, your family stand and stuff will be on the right. The, uh, this building is what you consider a green building. The lights, you walk off with the light switch, 15 minutes it's gonna cut off. Uh, the heat and air, it's, it's all uh, environmentally savvy, uh, but 
This is an industrial type of linoleum uh, floor. We originally would, would wanted to do stained concrete. Um, the cost was really high on the stained concrete, so we had to do this instead. This has got, I think it says 20 year warranty on it. But this room here, uh, it kind of speaks for itself. I mean, uh, it's it. What was here was was okay for an education room, but when we decided to take a restaurant, we needed to clear out because about right here where you were standing, there was a wall. There was a wall here, and then there was a utility closet, and you had a little hallway. And I, I, some of you may remember that. As we took the wall out, the room started to get. I mean, it, it, the second the second time I came here after the construction began. You know, nothing was done, but it was just a huge area. And we was like, let's be pretty good size little area. But apparently the whole area is 200 square feet. We'll go to the kitchen area. Uh, the kitchen equipment is installed yet, but we'll give you an idea of kind of what it was like in here today. Mm -hmm. What was this used for? Mm -hmm. This was the educational room. And part of the bathhouse, I don't know what it was originally used for. Michelle put a town every four was part of it. And um, this was just another part of the power house that ended up being sectioned off. Watch your step over there by that, that's a drain in the floor, so kind of watch your step on that. <laughs> yes, uh, I got the door most uh, industrial kitchens, half part of the you've got to have a restaurant inside the kitchen now if you build it. Uh, it's just sanitary purposes, they don't want them going back and forth. So this was actually at the end. This kitchen right here is still waiting on around two hundred some thousand dollars worth of kitchen equipment. Now it feels like why is it that much? This building has three phase electricity. Uh, you can see is the you know the top how big it is. Uh, you will have the automatic dishwasher here. Uh, you will have uh, steel tables, grills, and there's a cooler section here that has to be put in over to the left that has to be hand hand brought in and hand built here. Uh, some of the original bathhouse you can still see here but this eventually will be a walk-in cooler. And, uh, What's this sink? Now this is where your grills are. Oh, okay. So your, your, your cooking area is all the way from here to here. So in other words, if I cook hamburger, I'm handing it to him. He's taking it out front. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's fire suppression. This building uh, has two inch water service, so it does have fire suppression in it. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a lot here with that. Uh, anybody knows, just you know, this, this one may be locked, but which it is. There's two, uh, I think they're, they're huge hot water tanks. This, each section of this property has its own either water tank system or, you know, it's on its own electric meter. So in other words, if you lease this property, you, you have your own power meter. It's not running through the whole, the whole property. Um, these doors here to the right, uh, that's the entrance for the food and stuff like that. And then, like we said, this was an extra restroom for the uh, kitchen. And we'll show the ramp out here we was talking about earlier. Earlier, Michelle may have mentioned some golf carts. I don't know if she was talking about those or not. It's going to be eventually going through the mines. Michelle, you'll have to hold that door a um, Eventually, phase two and phase three, this building over here becomes like, kind of like a little train station, but it's for the golf carts. And you will get your ticket there, and the golf, golf cart actually goes to the town of Pocahontas, and we'll talk about the buildings, and we'll show the churches, and you'll eventually make your way back to the mines where you'll ride through. But that's the future of that building is it will be the outside will be redone to kind of look resemble kind of like a little train station to where you got a ticket where you're standing here like i said earlier is a ramp utility ramp for the restaurant but the lease c he wants to extend this for outdoor eating which we won't we'll have an issue for that'd uh, be nice yeah have it does you got good shade and uh, there's cosmetic things but this right here was actually and I don't know, Mr. Asbury, do you remember when, when this was a warehouse here, why this ramp was here or anything? Uh, I don't recall this this part of it. Uh, I don't know if this part of the warehouse do the one over here in the paradise. Okay. I've actually uh, left the mine to come here to get parts. Yeah. So right here was kind of a ramp, and they used to park some, uh, the trucks down for this ramp, and uh, Naturally, when they stored stuff in the main warehouse here before they, they built the new warehouse that Mr. Asbury is talking about here at the Paradise, this is where they stored vehicles and they come out and uh, load them. All your drainage actually comes around the building, all your drain box comes under here and runs under the property back to, it'll drain to the Bull Creek here. Uh, 
but there was not a lot of stuff done here. A lot of cleanup was done down here, but the uh, outside dining will eventually come to this wall here. And uh, at least he eventually wants music in the afternoon, things of that nature. Uh, so it's a lot. Uh, this side never had guttering or nothing like that, and you, all the windows frames. Uh, Michelle, you can actually take around the left and the red wall we'll that way. This is a perfect example right here in front of you of the Italian stonemasons. Um, a lot of the rock wall that holds the creek up in town is a lot like this. So that pretty much concludes our tour. You're more than welcome to look around in the museum, which was the original powerhouse for the mines. Um, you'll see a lot of interesting, neat artifacts and pictures from the early days here. Um, and if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask myself, Braden, or uh, Blake and Inside. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. built the opera house but they also built an original fire station here which over the years the town sold the property um they sold about three years ago but it was it's been in disarray for a while but since the time the virginia improvement company built these buildings the town of poconos is on them so when they went to sell that property there really wasn't a lot of deed work on it because it just said the rest of the town of pocahontas but it was originally the fire station then this becomes, this is the extra building. The town turned this into the fire station around in the mid 80s. Um, in 2005, they left this building and it collapsed on the inside. And through the years, the town actually went and cleaned, you know, cleaned it out. We was trying to save the facade here. Originally, what we're hoping to do, um, we just got a $30,000 planning grant for this opera house to try to uh, stay the feasibility uh, to save the property, but also the economic impact that it would have if it could be saved. So this side over here, which would be the fire station, would have an outdoor elevator to get to the second floor because once we get inside, you're gonna know the steps are very steep. They're not handicap accessible and they, they don't even meet standards today that Virginia Code would allow. But it's covered through, you know, being a historical property. Uh, but an outdoor elevator will be here in something here. Uh, I don't know if you've been to the Barter Theater. Oh, yeah. Uh, what's the Wolford House down Whipple? How they got more of a, a uh, waiting area before you go upstairs to a dinner show. Maybe this could be incorporated here. It's all about a vision with these grants. And you've got to sell that vision and to show how it's economically feasible to do it. This property has been closed for two and a half years. Um, about two and a half years ago, um, you know, we, we wanted to have a uh, structural stability study done. Thompson Linton donated their services. They come in and said, what they see the outside of the building is in remarkable shape. It needs, you know, some scoring in the bridge and stuff. The outside is pretty stable. Um, what, what hurts this building the most is sand mortar. So water comes and starts washing the sand out, things start to sag. So on the inside, we noticed some issues around the windows and stuff. And once we had our structural study done, on the second floor where the windows are on the outside where the joists meet where the brick the joists set in the brick and they're fire cut a lot of times the older buildings they cut the ends of the fire uh, then the joists over there call them fire the buildings just fall on the inside they can rebuild so the key to this building is take the weight off the walls and build a steel structure inside of it and then go put the weight on the inside so so the building has been set for two years so when you get inside it will be nasty and dirty because it's been setting but yeah. remember it's under a uh, process to try to be saved. Well, what is this gargoyle about over here? Do you uh, know? The gentleman that bought that building, he bought a gargoyle off. I know when y'all come down from the exhibition, they so got made some little concrete uh, statues. He bought that gargoyle and put it up there. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but people ask about it all the time. Yeah. They think it was with the property, you know. 
He could probably tell an interesting story if you really thought about it. Yeah. Uh, brick streets, 1910, they were put in. And uh, before that, you know, now she was all dirt and uh, mud and things. But you're liable to see pigeons or anything in here, okay? But you mm -hmm. so understand that well, this is trying to save this property. To your left, you're, you're going to see pigeons, okay? They, they get from the windows. Okay. This was the draw of the concern of what started uh, the issues of us uh, trying to save this building. The town moved out of this property in 1986. They continued to use the opera house for different things and they'd have council meetings up through here. When I was a kid, now this is how much I've been around the governor, you guys see? <laughs> so, the time I was seven, eight years old, there was benches through here. And dad would come to a council meeting and I would be bored to death sitting on these benches and I remember they were so uncomfortable. They was not made for comfort. And uh, so I had a lot of memories of being in this building here. And the benches were actually, this building went through a flood in 2015. You can go back through some of the history of the town, 2015. This under here, there was water. Gosh, it was probably over this table at one point. So we had to come in here in 2015, we, we cleaned up a lot, but that's what really started the outside problem. It was raining so much, it washed a lot more out. So the benches, we, we actually took them outside, got them dried out, and they're, they're upstairs, we'll see them here in a minute. Uh, watch your step here, uh, it's just what it is. Uh, that's the original stand for the judge, you know. Uh, earlier he's talking about, you know, Mr. Gilmore real well, and actually he would have held his council meetings here. Uh, during his time, this, they moved out of this property and moved into um, east uh, on Main on Center Street beside the current town hall, which was serving as the post office. They bought that ball, a building from uh, Poco's Fuel Company for at the time it was ten thousand dollars. So they moved their offices up to the second floor. They stayed there until 1991 until they moved to the old uh, stone bucket from the cricket down there. You know, this is where we moved there. And in the past three years. We moved to the new location that we're at the town hall and that post office moved to the other one. Watch your step here. This is the original jail cell. Uh, a lot of people were fascinated by this. Uh, if you if you look at the uh, hole, there's little holes in the bed, you know, uh, where you put your mattress. Now my grandfather, he, he said he spent many nights in here and there was 98 holes in the bed. He'd lay a count on above him, you know. So uh, these are the original jail cells. Uh, they all had, uh, you know, national toilet to sink in them. You can go through the basement area and you can still see the plumbing to that. Uh, that way they heat, heated this was with the cold stuff one time and then they switched to a radiator system sometime in the 20s. Uh, the last, uh, Mr. Childress had passed away, he can tell you the last time that uh, there were prisoners held here was in the 70s. And they were still holding some court here up to it was 71 or 72 and what happened was uh, the judge would come over and actually he, they would bring the clerk you know to talk to the minutes of the court session well the clerk that day stood up against the wall and got her dress dirty yeah okay got her dress dirty and the judge said you know this building's getting too old and nasty he said we're, we're gonna quit having court over here i'm gonna stop it and that's what happened. That's that's when they moved out here in the, in the early '70s. And they quit holding prisoners here. Today's standards, naturally, the jail system wouldn't you know meet any kind of standards you have to have for a jail. But um, I've also seen here around 1996 there was a haunted house in here. Now you're thinking they call it the haunted jail. I can remember you know you come through and you go through the jail and it looked like prisoners were in there and. Uh, uh, it, it was pretty good. Now we'll go upstairs. The steps, be careful on them. Uh, if you, we was talking about the original benches right here. They are. And, uh, but there was a slope in the floor here. And right in this section here, uh, it's just due to some old wood that caused the sagging floor. And, uh, you know, this is part of we want to see an elevator put in this section here from the outside that what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people, they're like, what is this right here? And uh, why is this here? I'm going to let you guess what that is. Uh, 
fire hose. Yes, you're right on. <laughs> that was the fire system for up here. I don't know call it fire. And uh, there's something else. But this road right here is a Persian road. I, I was going to ask you about that. I'll tell you where it came from. So the funeral home that was on East St. Clair Street caught on fire, right? And this was the only thing they managed to save that funeral home was caught on fire was this road. And uh, it's not been cleaned. We don't know how, we, we don't feel safe to get it wet trying to clean it. Uh, there's been a lot of talk of different things that can be done to it. But this was a Persian rug out of the funeral home burnt man. Hmm. This stage here, uh, naturally, you know, the curtain, the curtain's on the floor back here. It has to be rehung. And I'm sure I was talking about unrolling that, but it's not actually hung right now because. This hang from a chain, the chain broke, and we've had it rolled up back here. Um, naturally, on the floor, there's, there's trap doors and things like that. Um, you can go under this stage, we're not going to go today. I'm just going <laughs> to tell you, uh, because the structural things of this building, I'm, you know, I've got to kind of watch. But up there is the balcony. Uh, you know, there's steps. You want to see the balcony. And, uh, you know, those are better since that today, you know, if you use their play. There's also a bell tower exit to the bell tower. Mr. Childers, you know, he told me this about these lots. And these lots are not original. Sometime when World War I and World War II was going on, this turned into a little summer factory up here, okay? And it was leased out. Well, after the lease was over, they come back and all four chandeliers were gone. Yeah. So they were removed during those times. And uh, that, that my understanding is four chandeliers have hung down quite low, and they were removed when the lids come back out, they were gone. Um, you know, Mr. Rosick and, and individuals that passed away, they know a lot, they know a whole lot of history about this. In the 70s, they got a grant to do a lot of work in here. And uh, because I, I couldn't remember it, now Tommy was telling me that the floor would be sloped. I don't know if it was or not. I mean, I, I don't know, but it was kind of slowed down. I can remember uh, Maxwell House doing a coffee commercial here in town. Uh -huh. And when they did that, this is where you come to interview to try to get in a commercial. I can remember coming up the steps and they would, you know, they'd put you on camera to see if you were, you know, a perfect fit for the role or not. And, uh, but I remember that and then they used to have some dances up here in the 80s, I remember that. and then. Um, they had Halloween parties and stuff like that, but over the years, the town, since it wasn't its main main property, uh, from the 80s on, I mean, they, they cut funding back here. They were putting it in other buildings because this, it went up until 86 when they was here, they heated this property, they did everything, you know, because all their government money was put here because it was their main thing. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'd go up there, if I, I'm just, you know, I just, Okay, uh, but um, the thing with this was they, they pulled the money out in 86 and when they did this stuff started deteriorating. That's when um, the bill was just too big for the town to maintain what it was. And sadly it started going down. Work. That's a beautiful piece of equipment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Who's it made by, do we know? I don't know a lot about it. My brother could tell you. It's right on the front here, let's see. Um, it came from New York, but it was D. I can't see it's D. 